Hey guys, and welcome to High and Black. I'm Bissy Atkins, and High and Black is a safe space where you can get to know black people, learn about their black experiences, and how they've navigated their lives and careers as black people. On today's episode, I am joined by the one, the only, CEO and founder of 2020 Change and filmmaker, Duro Oye. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? I, I feel good. I feel blessed. Awesome. Um, I feel like we're in like this time where everyone's just like, things are up for me. And it's tough times in terms of just corona, in terms of COVID, in terms of lockdown, in terms of all of this uncertainty. I, just, I feel like I just don't know what's going on. But over the past few days, I've been doing okay. That's good. Just the past few days? Just the past few days, wow. I'm being honest. Just the wow. past few days. I feel like it has been a bit techie but um i'm doing well now. Cool. so you've managed to bounce back yeah it's good to hear how about you how's time been for you um sometimes i feel bad saying it but mm-hmm. um it's been good it's um lockdown's been good it's been a reflective time for me obviously everyone had plans for 2020 my whole organization is called 2020 change so mm-hmm. we had big plans for the year 2020 but thankfully things are still positive um, we've had our most productive, impactful um, year so far, which is good. It's just not what everybody can say, but thankfully we're in a position where we can say that and really excited for what's happening in 2021 and, and beyond. Mm. So I know many people don't really like being asked this question, right? But who is Duro Oye? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I'm a social entrepreneur and filmmaker um yeah i mean that's top line well yeah we can dive into it in a bit more detail but if you ask me who i am based on what i do that's me but if you ask me who i am all encompassing i'd say i'm a change maker you know and i've devoted my life to changing lives in everything that i do so you being a change maker you being a philanthropist you you being who you are right now. Can you take us back to the genesis of life and what it was like growing up as a young boy? How young are we talking? As young as you can remember. Um, So I came into the country and I was five. No, seven. Seven. I corrected that recently because I always thought it was five, but when I look back at the dates, it was actually seven. Um, And yeah, we grew up in Tottenham. North London, um, brought off Farm Estate. And you said you came into the country, was that from Nigeria? From Nigeria, yeah, okay. so Nigerian, born. Um, <laughs> Even though I was born here, I really... No, we accept you, we accept you. <laughs> but um, yeah, like, we had a comfortable life, in my opinion, in Nigeria. Um, but my parents felt like, you know, me coming to the UK would give me a better life, a better opportunity. Um, but they stayed back in Nigeria and sent me to live with my sister. Obviously, when you're in Nigeria, you feel like, you know, the UK is great, you know, you got pounds and all that good stuff. But I got here and we were in council estate and four daughter farm. I thinking, I'd rather go back. And I remember I used to call my mum on a weekly basis, crying, saying, I want to go back. She's like, no, just ride it out. You know, she didn't say that, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, her patience, it will work out. Um, yeah, so I, I originally landed in North London. By the time I was in year six, I moved to another sister of mine in South London, South East London. And that's where things kind of really just, just started for me. Um, in North London, I wasn't really impressed or inspired by my surroundings. Um, there were a lot of Jamaicans and Caribbeans in, in Bulldog Farm at that time. Um, I didn't really... I wasn't proud of my African heritage, anyone growing up in and around that time no matter how they want to lie to you, but we all wanted to be Jamaican, let's Definitely. face it. You know, my name was actually Jerome. <laughs> back well, then. To Jerome. Yeah, yeah, I fully. I had a Caribbean name. I had, had a Caribbean name. Or something there like you that. go, but we all have it. It's all in there somewhere. <laughs> People ask me, what about your nose and your accent? And then, yeah, they get a punch in the face. But that was a different time. Um, but when I moved to South London, there was a lot more of a Nigerian presence. Um, and we kind of like the fact that we could speak Yoruba because, you know, we have our own little twang and all that. And, you know, we could mock girls, mock guys, hide things from the police and all that good stuff. So it kind of helped. Um, and I always say that we were the set that kind of made it 
cool. Cool to be Nigerian. Do you know what I mean? Like every after after us, it was one of those things that people said, yeah, actually, I want to be. That's when the whole Nigerian mm. thing kind of came out. Um, obviously, it's nothing to be proud of, but there is something to be proud of in there as well. Yeah. Because um, obviously, Nigerians back then, even now, are known for certain things. Um, even now, let's, I don't think <laughs> let's not go into that. But yeah. Um, that's how it started, and um, yeah, so I was in South London, and I remained in South London until, you know, I started making money, then I moved to East London and, and Docklands, Canary Wharf, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And growing up in South London, did you embark on, because I'm from South London, I grew up in Brixton, really mm. close to Angeltown, mm. um, and I've just recently, not recently, in like 2008 or something, moved to Croydon side. Cool. I wish I was still in Brixton, to be honest, because the property... Yeah, like, it's gentrified now. Gentrification <laughs> it's helped, it would yeah. Be worth so much money, but they don't tell us. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, um, Well, did you experience um, any criminal act? Activities either for you personally or in your surroundings? Well, I mean, obviously it was criminal, but we didn't call it criminal then. Even now, I found like a, a politically correct term that I use to um, describe my past, and mm. I call it street enterprise. Street enterprise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those things that, well, well, like we had a group of us that used our minds to come up with money-making schemes, um, quick money-making schemes. And yeah, we, we did it, and we did it very well. We were very successful at it. Um, and I was involved in that <clears throat> from the age of 12 right through to 21. 12 to 21? Yeah. I'm trying to understand, or I want to know, like, what, is, what makes you want to be in street enterprise at 12? Well, I mean, if you live in a household where you want more than what you're given and you'll be willing to do whatever it takes to get that more, that was my situation. Everyone's situation is different. Now, my household, they provided for me everything that I needed. So all my basic needs were met. And obviously, getting involved in what I got involved in, I got to meet other people that their living situations were far worse than mine to the point where I started becoming grateful. Mm. for what I had. Um, but I guess it wasn't until much later that you look back and you realise you didn't necessarily need to. So for me, and I can't speak for everyone, I could definitely put my hand up and say it was greed. Like my eyes were definitely too big for my head and I wanted, you know, I talked about that instant gratification. I wanted what I wanted now as opposed to working towards it and getting it in the future where it made sense. So I wanted all the things that everybody else had. Um, that most of them worked for. But, you know, I was a young teenager and I was like, why can't I drive that? Why can't I shop there? Why can't I eat there? Who's going to tell me otherwise? Um, and because the money came in so quickly, it went out so quickly as well. So my appreciation of money was just, I mean, it comes, it goes. I, I didn't value it in the same way as everybody else that worked for it. Um, so for me, it was more those that I want this and I want it now and I'm going to do whatever it takes for me to get it. And from the age of 12 to 21, um, I don't know if I can ask, like, what is your most memorable moment, but what is the, is there a moment in that time where you're just like, no, nah, I need to get out, this isn't for me? It was 21, definitely. Um, so I think it, it, it started from probably about 19, 20. So when I went to university, I was like the first one out of my whole set to go to uni. Um, and I obviously left the ends to go to uni, so I went to uni and it was Luton then, it's now Bedfordshire, just mm. giving away my age a little bit. <laughs> um, and it was being away from everybody else and realising that I'm actually quite different, you know, what their motivations are is very different to my motivations. They did things for one reason and I did it for another reason. And a lot of the things that we did with the money that we made, I didn't really enjoy. So, you know, you go party, you go clothing, you go pop bottles, you have the table, all of that. I got to an age where I kind of outgrew that. I always tell people that um, I've lived life and I, I'm looking forward to getting older. Like a lot of what people my age and my peers are doing, I did years ago and it's like I'm over it. I'm in a completely different frame of mind now that I'm now thinking about 
my kids and the neighborhood that I want to live in and the school that I want them to go, all of that kind of stuff. I'm thinking like way ahead, whereas people still driving around want to be stunting and all of that. I, that is yeah. done and dusted. So yeah. I'm not even moved by that anymore. So my motivations are still very different, but it's because I had experienced it quite early on, mm. done it, it's over and done with. So for me, it's like, it was definitely going to uni and realizing that we're actually not the same. Mm. What I want out of life is different to what they want. But then there were little moments that I started to think, all of these get rich quick schemes that I was coming up with in my mind, I was actually making them up in my mind. So I have a, a, a very creative mind wild imagination um, but I just used it for a lot of the wrong things and then I started having these internal battles that like will kind of be fighting myself as like your mind isn't really that great if you think about it, a lot of what you're doing could be down to luck if anybody else tried it if they tried it enough times they'll probably get the same results as well so you know your mind isn't as great as your mind thinks it is mm. I'm like no but it actually is yeah. and I'm there fighting myself internally I'm like let me actually put this to work. Let me try and create something from nothing on my own, using my mind to see whether it would actually work. Mm. And I also started thinking about long-term, what do I want to be known for? You know, when um, I start having kids and like my nephews start growing up and they say, you know, this is their uncle, what does he do? You know, mm. what's he known for? Is it still going to be the same street recognition or street rep that I had that that's what's carrying me on? And all of this can go in an instant. Mm. What happens when it goes? Can I get back up again? And even if I do get back up again, will I get back up in the same way? And I started to think, what can I build that will stand the test of time? So even when I am removed from the equation, it could be a thing where it's still there. And it's because I created it in my mind. And that's, that's where the challenges came. Um, obviously, you grew up in a Christian home. You go to church, you're forced to go to church. And you get to an age where you, you have to make that decision whether you want to continue on that journey on your own. I decided, I mean, not that I'd not to, but I just didn't take it seriously. Mm. Um, so I'd go to church, but nothing is sinking in. I'm still doing what I'm doing. Um, but it was at the age of 21 that I said, you know what, if I'm really going to do this, I'm going to go all in. So I'm going to stop everything that I'm doing negatively, doing this positive path, but also, like, really take my walk with Christ seriously. Mm. And uh, even because even that, I was half-hearted. It was always one foot in, one foot out. You know, you're here, you're there. So I decided to do both at the same time all in, like literally cut ties with everything that I knew from that world. Literally walk into the church and say, look, here I am, whatever you want to do with me, do with me. I'm not leaving. Mm. That was it. It was at 21. That year. And that was it. So it was 16. Yeah, 16 years ago now. 16 years ago. And I haven't looked back since. And when you made that decision at 21 to focus on God and focus on everything that isn't the gang life or isn't that street crime, um, how did your steps manage to get to 2020 change or to the films that you've been producing mm. and directing and documentaries? How did you get there? It was just one step at a time. Like, if you'd asked me at 21 if I knew that in 2020 we'd be sitting there talking about things that I've done, probably wouldn't have listened to you. I was a very, very different person, very shy, reserved, quiet, background type person. You won't see me in the forefront. Um, <clears throat> but as I started to start, as I started taking my walk seriously, yeah. I started seeing visions of the person that um, God wanted me to become. It didn't match up <laughs> with the person that I was, you know. So it's like, Are you sure? But you know, the more I took those steps, the more things just started to unravel, and it made sense. So the first thing was filmmaking. You know, I, I started off filmmaking. So the church that I was in at the time. Um, they had a TV station, so I was volunteering there, fell in love with filmmaking. Um, while I was there, I was volunteering there, then they employed me. While I was there, I went to film school in the evenings, learned how to become a director, and started making like little short films. Then I made a documentary on gang culture. By the time I made the documentary, I was no longer part of the TV station. I got to meet some like, amazing individuals. Um, free from Peckham, free from Brixton. If you're from South London, you understand mm -hmm. the yeah. rivalry. Yeah. yeah, so just even bringing them together to talk about their story was a whole, like, different issue on its mm -hmm. own. But doing that, I got to realise that there are actually individuals that have the same journey as me, made different choices, but their 
grow like their 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 upbringing was very very different to mine, mm -hmm. but they were still involved in the same thing. Granted, to a different extreme, but there were parallels that we could draw from each other's journeys. And I was thinking, how many more young people are there like this out there that all they need is a bit of guidance? Like mm -hmm. I was, I, I managed to turn things around at quite a young age, about 21. You know, I met them after they were 21, and they were still. They had made that decision to want to transition, but they didn't have the help and the support that I had, like the people that I had around me, the mentors and like positive people showing me that like, you've actually got something. No one actually ever told them that. People just told them that you'd have to go back to school, get your education, all of that. To them, that's long. I've been making money. Why? Why would I not go back, yeah. you know? But I then was able to show them in the same way that someone showed me that you actually have relevant skills. Mm. just build on these skills and you'll be able to access this, you'll be able to access that. No one's ever told them that before. So I became that person telling them that. And they were like, actually, that makes sense. Mm. Let me try it. And that's how <clears throat> 2020 Change kind of evolved from that. My dream was just to make the documentary, give it to youth organisations and get them to turn it into workshops, take it into schools, prisons. And that was kind of like my agreement with God that, you know, this is my debt to society for all the wrongs that I've done. This should sort that out. Please. But he, he had other plans, <laughs> you know. Um, so we, we had a premiere for that film at Odeon Leicester Square. We invited all of the youth organisations that I could think of. 850 people there, it was amazing. We had standing ovation, people were crying, laughing. Everything that I wanted to happen at that premiere happened. And then we had the Q&A, people asked, okay, so what's next? What are you gonna do? You told them the plan. Like, yeah, let's support, let's do this. I was like, great, it's done. Um, and then about two weeks later, literally nobody responded back to my phone calls, nobody responded back to my emails. And I was sat there with a hard drive of the film, which essentially cost about 47 and a half thousand half of which I had to borrow from various other sources. Um, some of the money was my own. Um, I was just sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? Mm. You know, um, and I made promises to the guys in the documentary that you know, this documentary will change lives. You know, and that's why they were open to being a part of it, being open and honest about their journeys as well. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna have to do it. You know, and I set up the organization back in 2013 we've just been building ever since. So it took about five years of us piloting the program, working with various different young people from across London, um, looking at the journey, my transition, the steps that I took, tailoring that into a structured program um, with the view that a corporate sponsor would come along and um, fund the work that we were doing. I didn't want to go through a uh, government route or anything because I felt like they would like to change the program to make it suit their agenda and stuff. And I knew that the program would work because it worked on me, worked on the guys in the documentary and worked on the guys that I met after that as well. So I wanted that and our big break came in 2018 mm. when um, the Converse to Trainer brand literally read about us in the Evening Standard and said, we love what you guys do. How can we support? And obviously, because I already had it in my mind that I wanted a corporate sponsor, when they asked me that, I just pulled out my list. <laughs> um, literally, yeah. it wasn't even signing at the time. It was just literally pulled out of the list. I gave them a, a whole list of demands, and the GM just looked at me, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. I was like, right, OK, cool. Yeah. So we signed a three-year deal, and that was in 2018, and everything has just been up and up since then. I love that. And we're going to get to where you are now with 2020, but just to go back to the gang life and you being able to speak to different people and show them that they didn't really need to make those choices that they made, even though there was parallels that you said that you guys could identify with or relate to. When you say people can make different choices, because I've had conversations with a few people that have been in that gang life before, and I've never really been able to comprehend like, why would you decide to go down that route? Like, why? And a common response is that they would, that, that was their only way out. Like, that's what they saw and that's what they felt like they needed to do to become better. Either if it was financially, in terms of their relationships with their, I don't know, they didn't have a good father figure or whatever. And you're saying, no, it's not that. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I can only speak for myself and based on the young people that we've worked with over the years, 
I always like to challenge people that say, you know, I'm a product of my environment. Mm. Everyone says that it's, it's, it's a quick, easy answer that you can think of, but I get, I challenge them on that and say, actually, you know, you're a product of your choices because everybody has a choice to make. And even if you look at the worst council estate in London, you can trace people that made positive choices and came out of that situation. As a young person, you're looking around and you only tend to see those that made it out quickly, you're ever doing drugs, fraud, robberies, whatever. And I always like to challenge people again, it's like you're, you're being short-sighted. You know, you have to think about that long game. I didn't yeah. at the time. You know, I was thinking about that instant gratification. And for me, it was like, that's the fastest and the easiest way out. But really and truly, I had so many different situations that I could have got caught up in that I wouldn't actually be here. And, and it's risky, but I was willing to, to take that risk in order for me to say that I came out. A lot of people will say that, you know, they get involved in it because they want to help their parents. Everyone's struggling. But then if you look at those that say that, they're in a better position, supposedly, but their parents are still in the same position that they were in. Parents are still in that council estate. And maybe you gave your mum a couple hundred pounds to pay bills, but that's not really a long-term solution. If you get caught up once you start having kids, you're not going to be around anymore. Everyone's just in that instant gratification stage. There's a lot more that you can draw out of that situation if you're thinking long-term. And it will also protect you from making dumb decisions as well. Because a lot of people, because of the money that they don't have now, and what they could possibly get now, they could easily just go out and do a robbery, get a few grand, and that's it. And that few, how long is that going to last you? And then in your mind you think, oh, it was so easy the last time, I'm going to do it again. Then you get caught, you've got a few years under your belt, go out, come out, come back out again, and it's like that cycle just continues. But if you put in half, even not even half, just a quarter of the energy and the effort that you put into doing the wrong thing, into something positive, you'll start to see that you're getting results. Come, they won't come back quickly, don't get me wrong. Even when I was on the straight and narrow, it's been, what, 16, 16 yeah. years now. And I feel like it's only now that I'm in a position where I can be like, I'm free. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a level of freedom that I have that I've never actually experienced. I actually thought that it would be later on in life that I'd experience this level of freedom. But thankfully, by God's grace, I'm here now. Do you get it? And for me, I feel like I'm here now. It's just to shine that light to others to let them know that you can do it too. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, for me personally, I'm, I want to be the person that I wish I had when I was their age. That's why I give so much of my time with myself and I'm just constantly pouring out because I know that if I heard some of what I'm saying now when I was in their position, maybe I want to change straight away, but it would have planted a seed. seed right? It would have planted a seed and that's all you need. And the more we see more positive people coming out of those negative situations and turning it around for the better, the easier it is for us, the younger people, to believe it. So it's not just rapping or sports. No matter what it is that you want to do, you can do it. But you need someone to be able to kind of show you the ropes and connect you to the right kind of circles as well. And that's what we do as an organisation. Yeah, that's what 2020 came here. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. Like, I, honestly, I was just like, yeah. I'm going to get this out. I'm going to do all this out. No, it's okay. actually up to 30. Up to 30? Yeah, 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 we had a few of your friends on as well. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you see, my friends, you didn't put my friends. Friends, love, love, why didn't you? Actually, no, I think Titi. Okay. Titi said, Titi, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, when are you next taken in? So we, um, the program is a six week program, about 13, 14 sessions over six weeks. It's a huge commitment, definitely worth it. Every other month we have a recruitment drive. So we've got one going on at the moment. It's the last one for the year. Next one starting in January, 2021. So we tend to work with about 125, 150 young people each year. And we're looking to double that by next year, so we're looking at 250, 300. That is amazing. And before I let you go, I just want to know, what would you say has been your greatest lesson in life thus far? Patience. Hmm. It's crazy, because obviously, like, it's not until later on that I realised, because that's my name, if you look at it, in its original form, and its meaning, um, have patience. That delayed gratification, can't put a price on it. You know, and if I was to go back to my younger self, it's just enjoy the journey and, and, and be patient for what's coming your way, but you have to work towards it as well. Don't just sit in your mum's house and think 
<laughs> yeah. A job's gonna land, a business is gonna land, I'm gonna be turning over, I don't know, 500k every year. It's not gonna, you have to work towards it, but enjoying the journey and having patience, having the patience that requires for you to get to the end of that journey. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your story. No problem, thank you. For blessing us with your presence. <laughs> it's been amazing. The work you're doing is absolutely amazing. And thank if you. people want to, Find you, find 2020 Change. Please do all the plugs for the social media. Yeah, sure. So 2020 Change, we're on all social media platforms at 2020 Change. So the number's 2020 Change. Um, website, www.2020change.org. And um, my Instagram is mr.oye um, on Instagram and pretty much all the other social channels as well. Love that. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of the High and Back Podcast. Um, make sure you, I don't know, do you subscribe? I, I don't know what to tell you to do, but just share it with your friends and your family and let us know what you thought about it in the comments below also. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'm Missy Ikekins and we will see you in the next one.